Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another episode of Weekly Used Gun Review. Remember these videos, I just take a sample of about eight to 10 firearms and we go over a minute or two minute long review of each to give you guys a good wide variety of different things that might exist out there on the market. Uh, keep in mind, nothing in this video is for sale. This is strictly meant to be educational. But with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it now. All right, starting off, I have a J.C. Higgins Model 583. And just so you remember the format, we're gonna move through the more uh, common firearms up to the more uncommon firearms as the video progresses. But in our number one spot, like I said, J.C. Higgins 583. This is a 16 gauge, bold action shotgun. Uh, Sears and Roebuck used to sell, of course, they used to sell a lot of products through mail order catalogs. And J.C. Higgins was a Sears and Roebuck brand. And these are very, very common firearms that, of course, you could order straight to your door through the mail. Of course, those were the good old days of gun ownership. And this is a nice icon of that era. Now, these were purchased by many, many, many people. They were very affordable, and they still are today. I mean, on the used market, you're between $100 to $150. Uh, in today's dollars, it's probably about, you know, back when these are really popular, 60s, 70s, sort of in that era, that's about, if we adjust for inflation, about what this would cost you, about $100, uh, again, in today's dollars. So very, very easy for the average common man to afford, and uh, they were very reliable, being a bolt action assembly, not really a whole lot to go wrong, not a whole lot of parts required. Uh, these sorts of... Uh, you know, bolt action shotguns, of course, were a little bit of an advantage over the traditional top break, which was the other sort of option at the time, if you wanted an affordable shotgun. At that era, you're getting into pumps and especially some automatics, you're gonna be spending a little bit more money. So if you have a ranch, or you occasionally want to go hunting. Uh, this was a great sporting shotgun for that purpose. These things uh, claimed many rabbits, uh, birds, you know, anything. So. Um, you do see these pop up pretty frequently in a gun store on a used gun shelf. Again, typically the lesser expensive firearms don't hang around too long because it's a quick and easy thing for somebody to pick up that maybe you occasionally you go hunting, you might have a buddy come in from out of town, you want to set up with a shotgun. This is something you can beat up, throw around. It's not going to really matter too much because again, they're not very expensive. But really kind of cool staple in a classic era of firearm ownership and it's really cool when these things come in really robust strong built actions and uh, just a nice all-around uh, utilitarian shotgun up next i have a sar arms cm9 of course this is another one of those you guys have seen these things um, uh, show up these turkish made polymer framed firearms at fire and double single action Again, a really, really, really good budget. They sort of take a page out of the book, the CZ, with sort of wrapping uh, the frame around the slide, getting a little bit of a lower bore axis. Uh, sights on this are adjustable. Does have a manual safety, but no decocker. Uh, trigger pull on these is not bad at all. You have a three sight configuration made of metal. So, I mean, the quality of what you're getting here uh, it would kind of compare to something like a CZ P07, but a more economy based line of that. They are very functional and usable. Uh, of course, comes with two magazines, interchangeable back straps. So it has a lot of sort of the modern polymer features that you expect to see out of a box. Brand new, of course, you're gonna find these things at about the $300 mark. Uh, used, you're gonna find them between about two and 250, okay, depending on where you get it. So if you're looking for a good value, I uh, really should not overlook these. These do come in under a variety of different names. Um, of course, there are other things that are similar to it, like the EAA Witness, which you guys have seen on, seen on the channel. So this sort of double single action CZ clone type polymer frame gun is a very popular thing on the market. And of course, if you look around, you can find a nice used one like this at a very affordable price. Uh, great as a backup home defense truck gun or just for anybody on a budget. Again, remember at about $200, you're not that much more expensive than you are on like a brand new high point. And I think you're getting a lot more value out of something like this. It, even used, so something you should definitely consider. Okay, up next I have a CAR CM9. These make really good concealed carry handguns. This one has a few extra mags with it. Uh, the CM series uh, comes with just one magazine. You've also heard of the PM series, and those will come with two, and I'll talk a little bit about the differences. Brand new, the CM9 is gonna run you about in the low to mid threes, so three to 350. Use, you're gonna be in the low to mid twos, two to 250. 
They are a six round capacity striker fired polymer frame metal slide firearm. Uh, they do make them in a stainless slide and an all black slide, although I think the all black slide might be on the PM line only. Uh, I, correct me on that if I'm wrong. Uh, this particular one does have night sights on it, which were actually, no, that's not a night sight. That's a, I thought it was a true glow, but that's actually just been painted red by the previous owner. Um, the triggers on these, because you have no manual safety, the trigger is pretty long and to a lot of people pretty spongy, but it's got a positive but long reset as well. So your pull is all the way to the back. Your reset is almost all the way back to its starting position. So very, very spongy, lots to take up. But keep in mind, this is a deep concealment pocket carry or inside the waistband firearm with no manual safety. So it's kind of like the same uh, safety concepts of like a double single action, that long uh, double action trigger pull, but it is a striker fired handgun. These are very reliable. And you know, again, for the money, even new as a concealment, as a concealed carry gun, they are very, very tiny. It's going to be about the size of a SIG P365, even though that's 10 rounds and this is six. Um, but used, of course, if you can find one, you know, like I said, around the 250 mark, a really good budget for a concealed carry option. Now, like I mentioned, they do have a PM line version of this, which is about twice the price tag, brand new, about 6 650 but that has more machining on the slide. It has a completely different barrel. It's more of a target uh, barrel. Um, it comes with two magazines. It's got a total uh, machined from a single piece of uh, bar stock, uh, sort of what I want to say, the, the barrel and, uh, and slide retention uh, pin, uh, the takedown pin, if you will. Uh, this is a investment cast part. So anyway, um, really, really cool firearms. They do come in from time to time. The car line is sort of in this configuration like Glock. It kind of carries a similar mold, but they do vary in size and caliber. So go check out their ca catalog if you think this is something you might be interested in. Okay, up next I have a surplus firearm. This is a CZ-82. Uh, these are imported by Century and PW Arms most recently, but this one is a Century import. Comes, of course, you can tell the little Century box with the Century hang tag. You're gonna find these in like Wasp or AKs and stuff like that too. Of course, CAI imports on the front strap as well, and this has a leather holster. Uh, these do not come with it from the importers. Uh, this was previous, previous owner's firearm. Um, CZ-82, okay, so this is chambered in the 9x18 Makarov round, and a lot of people will classify this as a Makarov, although it technically is not. Um, around the period of the Cold War, you have a lot of firearms or a lot of sort of the Eastern Bloc, Com Bloc type countries going to a small sidearm like this, all chambered in the 9x18 Makarov. It would start off with Russia with the traditional true to form Makarov pistol that you guys all know, the uh, sort of the plum colored reddish grips with the star in it. We all know what a Makarov looks like. If you watch any movies or play any video games, you're familiar. Now, other countries such as Bulgaria, China, and East Germany would follow along with that traditional Makarov design. That's what they use. But other countries such as Pola uh, Poland with the Wanad, Polad, uh, the Poland with the Wanad, uh, P83, you have Czechoslovakia with the CZ82, uh, Poland also had the P64. Those are all fixed barrel straight blowback designs with the trigger guard acting as a locking me mechanism just like the traditional Makarov, uh, chambered in the same round, but these are not technically Makarov. So people like to, to lump them in as one group, but they're not technically in that, uh, in that category. As a surplus, this is a interesting firearm out of of uh, the Makarov variants. This is the only one to my knowledge that is a double stack. The P83, the P64, and the traditional Makarov are all single stack. So I believe you get 14, somewhere between 12 and 14 rounds in the magazine. Um, if you're not familiar with the round at all, think of it as a as a intermediary between a 380 and a nine millimeter. So 380 is nine by 17. The 9 Makarov is 9 by 18 and the 9 Luger is 9 by 19. So it's right there in the middle. It is a little bit of a snappy round, uh, but actually you can find it. I mean, we always have it on our shelf for somewhere around $17, $18 a box. Uh, there are uh, companies that manufacture it new and that's brass case. You can also get the, the steel or, or aluminum cased uh, uh, Makarov ammunition. Um, good viable defensive load and especially something like this. These on the surplus market are gonna be 
This one's in pretty poor condition, so I'd say around the 200 mark. Uh, in better condition, they're going up to about 300. But of course, like anything else surplus, these are still coming in uh, in low numbers. They are available, but of course, when they dry up, like anything else, we're gonna see them go up in price. They also had a version called the CZ83, and that was the exact same gun, but was a 380, and that was for export only. But these would have been used by their uh, police, definitely, and I believe they saw military service as well. Again, it is a double single action. The trigger pull on these is really, really nice with a really light reset. So for a military firearm, I actually think the trigger pull on this uh, really, really feels good for what it is. Very wide trigger metal. Um, because it is a full metal frame and slide, the weight on it's pretty hefty for what it is. So you might not, I mean, you could conceal carry, but definitely a good glove box gun or, um, you know, take it with you uh, hiking, a good backup. So really something that shouldn't be overlooked as both a collector and a utilitarian sidearm. All right, up next, I have the quintessential Glock. You guys have been watching these videos. I haven't been getting very many Glocks in as of late, but uh, anyway, I got a Glock Model 48 here. I've talked about these before on other videos, so I'll keep it brief. Of course, Glock came out with the 48 and the 43X at the same time. It's been about a year ago, about nine months or so ago. Um, basically, what it is is a one and a half stack. It was meant to be the competitor, the uh, specifically the 43X, which is the same as this gun, but stops about right here. Uh, was meant to be a competitor with the Sig P365. Uh, 10 round magazines, there is a company out there, I'll put a roll on the bottom here because I'm not remembering uh, exactly, I think it's Sheridan Arms if I'm not mistaken, uh, but they make a 15 round capacity that does not extend beyond the bottom of the grip. Uh, basically what it is is they used a metal body mag, a thinner mag, uh, magazine walls to fit almost basically a full double stack configuration inside the grip. So those are actually really cool and with 15 rounds, you're kind of competing a little bit better with the 365 and the Springfield Hellcat. Now this, like the 43X, uh, is the one and a half stack, but they extended the barrel out. And really essentially what this is, is a one and a half stack Glock 19. The Glock 19, of course, is 15 rounds. So with that magazine, you can get the same capacity as a Glock 19, but really cut down on the width of the firearm quite a bit. So pretty interesting concept. Now, brand new, these are still running about between 450 and 490, depending on where you find them. Uh, you, you should be able to find them in the mid to high threes, between about 350 and 400, uh, depending on condition. When these first came out, they were in a silver Cerakoted slide, and I've now discontinued those on both the 43X and the 48 and gone to an all plaque the um, NDLC coating like you get on the Gen 5s. So uh, interesting option. This one here just has a one mag in the box, but really cool firearms and Glocks of all shapes and sizes really sell pretty fast. Okay, up next I have a Canik. This is a TP9 SFX 9mm. And what this is is sort of their premier or top of the line of Canik's um, handgun lineup. A different optic plate adapter mounts in here. The two magazines with the extensions, so they're 18 rounds. Uh, striker fired. This one has the tungsten gray finish on it. The TP9, or let's talk about Canik in general because I haven't really talked about them that much on these videos. Um, if you are not familiar with Canik, it is definitely a manufacturer that is sort of beginning to hit the market by storm. They are known as being very good reliable, accurate, nice triggers, nice sights, um, and most importantly, they are affordable. You can get their baseline, like the TP9, you can get the TP9 SF Elite, the standard TP9 SF, the DA, the SA. You can get all those for about the three to 350 mark new. So used, you know, they're gonna be, you know, you should be able to find them for around the two to 300. Um, they are, for what they are, really, really good firearms. They're sort of inching out on the market of, say, Taurus. We're definitely seeing a lot more Canik sales than Bursa. Um, so sort of for the entry level line, actually, in my store, we're starting to actually order in and sell and transfer more Canics than like the entry level Smith line. Uh, I would still say the Taurus, like the G2Cs and G3s still outsell these. Uh, but this is their top of the line in terms of their series of firearms and typically without the optic you're going to find these selling around the 500 or so dollar mark 5550 and what you get is lightning cuts up here you get upgraded sights uh, and you get most importantly the optics plate you have the interchangeable back strap plates the two extended magazines if you get like a vortex uh, sight and they do sell this as a package i believe it comes with a vortex venom optic on it uh, that you're going to run about $700 new. 
but to get a optic ready firearm that really does in a lot of circles compete with some of the competition variants like the Glock 34 uh, or the um, XDM, the long slide uh, competition models from Springfield, these do in sort of the polymer frame lineup against its competitors that are, that are higher in price, they do stack up very well. People really, really like these. And anytime you know, we get into Canik new or used, they always get a lot of attention of buyers, especially first time buyers who are free of all the stigmas of you know uh, the gun brands that are already out there. You know, when, it, when you're talking to somebody with a blank slate and you put a Canik in their hand versus even Glocks or XDs or M&Ps, a lot of times, with the price point included, uh, a lot of people really do sway towards the Canik. So something you should definitely look at if you're not familiar with their products. I definitely really like them. And you know, of course it's great when they come in. Okay, up next I have a classic here. And if you are a Winchester collector or a Rimfire collector, you probably know what this is, but this is a Winchester Model 61. So coming onto the scene in 1890, Winchester would come out with their first variation of the pump action, a 22, which would really uh, they ended up with four variations, the 61 being the final one, which is the only one that did not have a hammer. But the Pump Action 22 Rimfire from Winchester would really dominate the scene in this space for the late 1800s through the, about the early to mid uh, 1900s. Marlin had versions, of course, as well. But this is a typical thing you would see at a shooting gallery or anything like that at a fair carnival festival, which is a totally different time uh, when kids would you know shoot at targets with this in a shooting gallery, typically with 22 shorts. Uh, this one, of course, is this one was actually dated 1952, so it is a post-war and was chambered for long short and long rifle. And the Model 61, every single one of them was a takedown with a 24-inch barrel. You could get it in either a round barrel like this or an octagonal. The octagonal is going for a little bit more money. Uh, also so the pre-war is bringing more money. Uh, very, very classic design. I mean, uh, tons and tons of people had, had purchased these things. There's a lot of nostalgia invested in this model, uh, the Model 61. Now it is a tube-fed 22 caliber pump action. There is a little pump release like you would find on a shotgun down here, and it does have an internal hammer, so it still is hammer-fired. Now the value on these things sort of runs the gambit anywhere from about, uh, in this condition, a post-war, it's all original finish and everything, uh, but some some thinning on the bluing and everything like that, it looks like there was some post-war, or I'm sorry, post-market, uh, aftermarket uh, sling mounts put on here by whoever owned it uh, prior, which of course that sort of thing drilling into the stock is gonna hurt the value, especially on a collector's piece like this. But this is probably gonna be valued in about the three to $500 range somewhere in there, maybe on the lower end of that. If you get a pre-war and mint condition, I mean, they can go up to $1,000, $1,500. So there are definitely collectors on these nostalgic pieces. I've had a handful of Model 61s in here, maybe two or three. So they don't come in too often, but when they do, there's always people out hunting for these. Um, even if you want a more shooter grade like this, uh, which is how I would classify it's still a fun little plinker on the range. Uh, definitely something worth considering, uh, but also very cool piece of Americana. Okay, finally, I have a pretty interesting one that you're not gonna see on too many of your dealers use gun racks. This is a number five Mark I, also known as a jungle carbine. Uh, Enfield number five Mark one. Now these would be manufactured for only three years. It would be 1945, 46 and 47. And it was a means to have a jungle use carbine. It was pretty much a use in Burma that gave them the idea that they needed a shorter uh, package to use. Now, of course, this would only stay in service for about three years. It exhibited a trait that many called the wandering zero. It had a problem with maintaining zero, among some other issues, including a very stout recoil that would not garner this a lot of favor and use, and therefore had a very short-lived history. And there aren't a lot of these that exist, which drives up their value. So they are about, if you're getting an all-matching correct and real jungle carbine, you're about six to $800. Now, because of that, and because of that value, there are going to be plenty of unscrupulous people who will take a standard number four Mark I infield and cut it down, uh, cut the barrel length down, put on the, the uh, jungle carbine muzzle device, we'll cut the stock down and then put on this, uh, this uh, butt pad and try and pass it off as an authentic jungle carbine. Uh, those, again, if you have a faked gun, they should be about two to $300, but a lot of people try and pass them off as an authentic for about six to eight. So you wanna be very careful. There are some general things to look for. There is uh, a lot of uh, weight saving measures that they took on this to try and make it not only smaller, but lighter. So you're gonna see a lightning cut in the bolt handle here a lightning cut in the receiver here, a lightning cuts in the receiver here. And the one 
uh, area where it's really hard for people to fake, and especially if they're going to go through machining, remachining, all this type of stuff, uh, it's not really going to be cost and conducive for them. But right underneath the handguard, you're going to find three lightning cuts right here on the barrel. A traditional number one Mark III, number four Mark I are not going to have those cuts as they're only made on the jungle, jungle carbine variant. So if you see those cuts, you see the lightning cuts in the receiver, that's going to be your biggest quickest giveaway that it is a real gun, if you, a real jungle carbine. If you don't see those cuts, it's definitely been faked. Um, another quick thing to look for, and I'll, I'll just put that back on a little bit later. Now the other telltale way that you're looking at an original number no. 5 Mark 1 jungle carbine is these were made by two manufacturers. They were made by BSA, British Small Arms, and uh, the uh, Royal Ordnance of Fizakerly. So if you see manufacturer markings from anybody else, uh, Savage, Long Branch, uh, Lithgo, you definitely know that it's a faked gun. Now this particular one is matching on both the receiver and the stock. Let's see here, let me confirm that. If I can find the serial number on the receiver. Yeah, matching on both the receiver and the stock, but not matching on the bolt or the magazine. So it is a mismatched gun, also has an import mark. So something like this, which is confirmed correct, uh, but is mismatched with an import mark is probably going to be in the four to five hundred dollar mark So between a really good condition authentic one and a, a faked one if you will or a reproduction One other interesting thing is this butt plate. It feels like it was made out of the same material They make bowling balls out of it's a very very uh, you know, does not do much to mitigate the recoil. The recoil on these is pretty stout. It's a very small and lightweight package in the British 303. So definitely a shoulder burner for sure. Uh, but really cool to see these things come in. In the six or seven years I've been here, I have had a total of three jungle carbines come in. Uh, one faked, I wish I still had it so I could show you, uh, and then two authentic. The other one was actually all correct and matching uh, with no import mark, and then there's this one, so right in between. Really, really cool to see these things come in, and of course, I always have surplus buyers and collectors in here so they don't last too long. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button. Also, if you want to see more content like this, please consider subscribing to my channel. If you want to see any vlog type content, please remember to go check me out on Marksman Radio. Anyway, guys, I will leave you there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV. I will see you next time.